I'm Jenny Kitzinger. I work at Cardiff University and I organised the Before I Die Festival. It was a festival designed to encourage public discussion and debate about death and dying and our own end-of-life wishes. And it was led by Cardiff University and it involved 28 events over 10 days. We had music, theatre, film, poetry, expert panels, uh, walks around cemeteries, visits to Iron Age tombs. I was influenced by my and my colleagues' research on long-term coma. That's when people are kept alive in a what's called a vegetative st state, so they may be apparently completely unconscious for many years. And I'm doing research on that uh, with colleagues here in Cardiff and also at the University of York, including my sister, Professor Celia Kitzinger. And we've been interviewing, doing in-depth interviews with families about their experience of this. And they often talk about this state as between life and death and as raising very profound questions about the meaning of life and death for them and their struggle to try and represent their loved one, their brother, their mother, their son, their partner, in terms of that loved one's own wishes, particularly in relation to medical treatment and end-of-life decision-making. There was a huge amount of energy brought to it from all the people um, at Cardiff and the other universities involved and the creative artists to contributing to the festival. And I had lots of conversations with them about their own experiences of bereavement, um, death, good death and bad death, and how important it is whether their loved one had had a good death or a bad death. And there's a huge range of experience there. So often people brought that kind of fire in the belly to their own contributions to the festival. But also there was kind of an alchemy, a, a sort of magic that happened with the participants who came to the festival. Over 700 people came. They ranged from being teenagers to many people over 70 who said they want to talk about the end of the life, but their children don't want to discuss it with them, for example. Never mind, mum, it's a long way away. So there are lots of people came who were indeed, either had a terminal diagnosis or were older people who were thinking about the end of their lives, who really welcomed the opportunity to be able to talk openly about death and bereavement and people stayed on after, after the formal events finished. People often stayed on for an hour or two hours just talking to each other about death and dying. And for me, that was, that was the power of the festival. And that came through in the feedback forms. People said it was brilliant to have a social context to actually talk openly about these issues. Um, the University of York, I believe, is now planning to hold a festival there with some of the performers that performed here, but also their new set of performers, and particularly taking forward the, um, the talks and one-to-one -one sessions for people about writing advanced decisions. A lot of people came away from the festival aware that their next of kin couldn't make decisions for them, and concerned about how their own end-of-life wishes might be respected and protected, and therefore wanting to write um, what's called an advanced decision. That's a legal document which became kind of legally binding in 2007 um, in England and Wales and people wanted to know how to write those so that they would be legally binding and in the right form so they need a bit of information and support often about how to document their wishes and then lodge it with their GP. That conversations all very well and conversation is part of this but unless you record your wishes you might not be able to safeguard them. So that's one of the things the University of York is taking forward and they have an ESRC seminar series on this topic as well. This is an issue that concerns everyone because we are all going to die. Um, so none of us can escape that. We may fight it in various ways for, for as long as is possible and for as long as we choose, but we are all going to die and we are all going to lose someone to death that we love. And 21st century has got very good now at saving the body, but much less good at saving or restoring the brain. So it's now estimated that one in three of us will live out the end of our lives without the ability to make our own decisions about 
what kind of medical treatments we want. And that's why it's so important to talk now, um, whether or not you're fit and healthy or you know you're facing a terminal disease, any of us could be in a car crash tomorrow. So it's really important to talk about these issues now. And I think for those who have a terminal diagnosis, they often feel quite socially isolated. People still cross the street to avoid talking to them or say, well, I just didn't know what to say. So for those facing a terminal illness, it's very important that we open up culturally and we open up our hearts to, to um, being respectful that having a terminal diagnosis and dying is also part of life. And no one should be excluded from society because they have a terminal diagnosis. And thirdly, many people who are bereaved have experienced, again, people crossing the street, not knowing what to say. And we need an understanding of bereavement and grief and loss and to be open to facing that again as, as part of life in all its painfulness. So people came to the festival from all sorts of different directions. Um, and although my research specialism is on the long-term coma or vegetative state, there are overlapping issues, for example, about end-stage dementia and how as a society and as family members we support people with end-stage dementia. And there were also issues at the very beginning of life, very, very premature babies who are born who would previously have died who can now be kept alive with intensive um, interventions. Mm -hmm. And that raises some very profound moral and political questions at both the beginning of life and at the end of life that need addressing openly and, and having a social debate about that. Mm -hmm. Not just having decisions made by default or defensive medicine, but we need kind of inf information and ethics mm -hmm. and looking at the organization of healthcare to support patient-centered care that supports health and well-being.